This is session number 100. Can you believe it? We've had 100 Tuesday evenings of Genesis Bible study. It's just incredible. And here we are in chapter 17. So you know we're going deep into the Word of God. And I'm just so thankful. With tenacity, we have to keep going after God and understanding His Word. So thank you to everybody who's joined. Well, I'm just so grateful for all of you, every single one. We've prayed for you. Know that you're not here by accident. There's no accidents in the universe. There's no such thing as luck. You're here because God is sovereign and we've prayed for you and we thank you for being here. This is Genesis Bible Study. I'm Shelley Prindle. You've tuned into Hope and Passion Ministries and we are so excited to be sharing God's word. Now I have some announcements for us this evening. Tonight's message of course is called The Laughter of Faith and we're also going to have a, a really neat session tonight about how we can overcome our weaknesses and our sins. Okay, don't forget to go to our YouTube channel to check out all the videos that are available, all the past presentations, anything that you may have missed is on there. And I just want to note too that although our live streams, we don't zoom in on slides, uh, when you go to the YouTube channel and watch it afterward, it is available uh, for you to get those zoom ins on different slides that make it easier to see. So. YouTube is a valuable tool there. I want to share two testimonies with you. All right, two testimonies from just this week. First of all, I received this one um, in a card with a donation. This woman wrote to me and she and her husband said, thank you, Shelly, for your ministry. I'm learning so much and feel so much closer to the Lord since finding you on TikTok and Facebook. I'm currently watching your Revelation series and look forward to reading, studying, watching your sermon lessons. It's the best part of my day. Hallelujah. People finding us on social media and growing in the Lord. So much closer to the Lord since finding you on social media. Praise God, right? We have people who have known the Lord and are growing closer to the Lord. And then we have so many people who have gotten saved under this ministry, who are asking the very basic questions, like this next testimony really blessed my heart. I saw this on Facebook. This person said, I love your teachings. I never knew who the Holy Spirit was or even who I should pray to. Thank you for teaching me. And I mean, the simplicity of that testimony just kind of grips my heart. You're somebody on Facebook. Never even knew who the Holy Spirit really was. And never really knew who to pray to. I'm telling you, there's some of us, we're growing deep in the Lord. And there are other people who are just coming to the Lord. And they're learning the basics. And Hope and Passion Ministries is doing both. And when this person says, thank you for teaching me, I want to extend that thanks, not just to me, but I want to extend it to all of you who give of your hard earned money and who give of your time through prayer and encouragement. I want to thank you and say to you that this person doesn't know all the people behind the scenes that have taught her how to pray and who the Holy Spirit is. But every one of you that gives is involved in that. And you will meet these people in heaven and you will see the reward of your eternal investment. And that is why, that is why I encourage you to give. Not because I'm telling you God's going to make you rich in this life if you give. I'm not making you any promises like that. The promise I make you is that when you get to heaven, you're going to see eternal results of what you've done. So you can give on Venmo. We are at Hope and Passion. Search us on the Venmo app to give very easily. And also hopeandpassion.org. You can give one-time gifts there. You can also go to hopeandpassion.org and become a monthly partner. And we appreciate those so much because we can budget and plan for future events and future broadcasts. So you can also, the old fashioned way, which is actually my favorite way because I like to go to the mailbox and see this, but you can write to us in Irwin, Pennsylvania. And we are blessed. We are blessed by your giving. I'm going to read the text of our scripture in just a minute, and I'm going to pray then. 
but I want to take the time to address the situation that's happening in the world as I did on Sunday morning. I want to address it one more time. I want to direct you to our YouTube channel if you'd like to see a video titled Russia, Ukraine, and Bible Prophecy. Get on our Facebook page, Hope and Passions Facebook page, my personal page. Uh, I just wrote another article concerning this just this evening before I came on the air. I want to address it because it's going on. Uh, we can't run from it. The world is in uh, dire straits this evening, right? Uh, we're looking at a very difficult situation where we have Russia has invaded, pretty much declared war on Ukraine. The devastation of the lives of the Ukrainians, the devastation of the people in Russia who are succumbing to a false worldview and the soldiers on both sides who are giving so much away and maybe they understand what for and maybe they don't. But as we look at what's happening, I want to assure you of something. This whole thing is following the trend line of the Bible. I do not know when Jesus Christ is going to return. My understanding of the Bible is that there is nothing left that has to happen before the rapture of the church. Even before this took place, there was nothing that had to happen before the rapture of the church because after the church is raptured out of here, we may have a, a, a certain amount of time before the official tribulation begins, but I'm telling you something. If you have studied Revelation with me, if you read the articles and the devotions that I write, you clearly understand this, that when the Antichrist presents himself on the scene, he will work with a confederacy of Western leaders. The Bible calls them kings. The Antichrist, when he comes onto the scene, will work with 10 Western leaders of what the Bible calls, according to Daniel and the book of Revelation, a revived Roman Empire. So when we look at those nations of Europe, when we look at the Western nations, those little nations in Europe that are uniting, and we see what Russia continues to do. The only thing that's happening that Russia is continuing to do is to unite the Western world together against this. And that's just another piece of the puzzle being put into place because I believe that all of those nations, the European Union, you know, whether we're talking about NATO, all these things, the uniting of these nations is part of what has to happen and it's going to be a part of what happens in the Bible. And I want you to know that Russia is a part of the battle of Gog and Magog, Gog representing the human ruler that will be a part of that war, Magog representing different nations that are going to go, including Russia and including other nations there in Central Asia and uh, including Turkey and Libya and, and different countries. That'll all be a part of the battle of Gog and Magog, which I believe happens in the first part of the tribulation. And God says, when those, when those countries come against Israel after the rapture of the church, that will allow God, God is going to draw those countries to attack Israel, and then he is going to go to war against them. And it will create a power vacuum in the world, which will enable Antichrist to step up during the second half of the tribulation and take full control of the world. So I just want you to know that as Russia, as one of the northern and eastern nations from Israel, continues to press on over to the West, this is only uniting the Western countries. And Antichrist will unite with Western leaders at the beginning of his career. He will use them and he will come from them. And then when the power vacuum occurs in the world, he is going to throw off all other rulers and claim himself to be God of the world and demand that he be worshiped. So I just, what I want you to see is we don't know how soon the Lord's coming back. This could be a very strong sign of the very end, or we could still just be moving towards the last stages. But what I want you to know is the Bible holds true and that everything that happens just follows that trend line of everything God said would happen. Amen. So 
you know, there's some people say we shouldn't worry so much about Bible prophecy. We should just worry about witnessing to people. Well, I'm sorry, but Bible prophecy is a huge part of witnessing to people. People get saved because they realize the Bible is real. It speaks to the world in which we live. God knows what's going on. Amen. God knows what's going on in your heart. He knows what's going on in politics. He knows what's going on in the economy. He knows what's going on socially. He understands what's happening with the wars and the rumors of wars. God is in control. So I just want you to be in prayer. We want to continually pray. Do you know that there is no one who is beyond the hope of God's salvation? Including Vladimir Putin and all these rulers. We can pray for God to turn their hearts. God's not beyond doing a miracle. Amen? Amen. So we're going to pray for that this evening. Now, I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. We are going to go over three verses this evening. Verses 15, 16, and 17. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 17, beginning at verse 15. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife... You shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? We're going to pray. Lord, I come before you and I thank you for your sovereignty over the universe. And I'm praying right now for every person who's tuned in. I know some of their names. I don't know all of them. But you know every single one. God, Psalm 139 says that you know the thoughts of our mind before they ever come to our mouth and are spoken. You know why every person is here this evening. And you want to reach them. And I pray that every person watching right now would know this. They would know your love. Whether they're currently trusting in Jesus as Savior or not, I pray that they would sense your overwhelming love pouring out upon them right now. I pray that every person that's watching would sense your overwhelming power and would know that your word has declared the beginning from the end. That nothing is beyond your understanding or your ability to work your plan. You're doing it, Lord. We come right now in Jesus' name and we pray for the leaders of the world. The leaders, the kings, the prime ministers, the presidents, we pray for the rulers of the world in Jesus' name. We pray, first of all, for their salvation, for them to humble themselves and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And God, even if they won't, we pray that as the Bible promises, you could steer their hearts to do your will. We pray for all those who are suffering, especially in the areas of Russia and Ukraine and the surrounding countries in Jesus name for the refugees, for the hurting, for the soldiers, for those who are devastated, Lord, in Jesus name, please provide for them and touch them and cause them through this circumstance to look to you, dear Lord. And even though they may be suffering on this earth, we pray that their eternal souls would be saved if they would know the promise of a new world where there is no more war, where Jesus is king. And I pray for the rest of the world. Most of all, for the salvation of many. Because we believe the time is short. One thing we can count on, Lord, is we're closer now to your return today than we were yesterday. Every day we inch closer. And I pray that people would trust in you as Savior before it's too late. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for praying with us. And now we are going to dig into the text. 
So God says to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Now God has already changed Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, and now he's about to change Sarah's name. What is the difference in her name? She was Sarai, and now she becomes Sarah. John MacArthur. Sarai can mean my princess, whereas Sarah means princess. So it's just a slight change. This is a subtle distinction, perhaps indicating that as the mother of many nations, she would become a princess to more than just her husband. Interesting. So heretofore, how many of you know I love three word words, right? I have this thing about three word words. I love to use heretofore, nonetheless, right? I love that kind of stuff. So heretofore, Sarai was only the princess to Abraham. But now she's going to be a princess to the world, in fact. The bigger issue, however, is that the Lord was changing her name as well as her husband's, indicating that she too was chosen by God for a special purpose. So this is not only about Abraham, it's about Abraham and Sarah. John Calvin explains it in more detail. He says, the Hebrew letter Y or Yod appears in the name Sarai, but not in the name Sarah. In Hebrew, the letter Yod acts as the possessive pronoun. This was now taken away. So God planned that Sarah's influence would be everywhere without exception. Okay, so instead of her just being my princess or belonging to just Abraham's family, she becomes the princess of many. There's no possessive noun. She's going to have influence everywhere. In terms of what John Calvin said, I want to, I want to go on this for a minute because God planned that Sarah's influence would be everywhere without exception. I want everyone to understand this. This is what one of the things I felt the Holy Spirit impressing on me. It's why I underlined this sentence of John Calvin's. It's why I'm going to bring up the following verses. If you belong to Jesus Christ, your life is not small. And you may feel like you only belong to or you only influence a certain group of small, a small amount of people. But that is not true. And that is not what you're called to. Your influence ripples out and your life is not small and neither was Sarah. So let's talk about this. You know, in John chapter eight, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We will have the light of life. That light will be in us. If Jesus is in us, then his light is in us. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Do you see what that says there? Now you are light in the Lord. Walk as if you are light in the Lord. And maybe somebody needs to hear that this evening. If you belong to Jesus Christ, this is what's happening through this ministry so often. We have people who I believe truly have trusted Jesus as Savior, but whatever teaching they've been sitting over, under did not take them far enough in what the gospel really intends for them to be. If you're saved and you've come to the Savior of light, then walk like you're in the light, right? And to walk, you know, light is an amazing thing. Because by virtue of its very existence, it dispels darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. So wherever light goes, the darkness kind of has to flee, doesn't it? If you bring light into a dark room, the darkness just goes. The light has the power. Your life has influence. And it doesn't just stay in this small little place. You influence, and then the person you influence influences someone else, and on and on and on it goes. I want you to know that your life is not small. And what God was doing for Sarah, he's calling many of you and saying, I'm doing the same for you. You may think you're only in this tiny group or you only belong to this tiny bit of people, but that is not so. 
Your influence is incredible and can be. Now, I want to take you to a very important verse in the Bible, Acts 1.8. Jesus is about to leave. He's about to ascend up to heaven. And here's what he says to his disciples. He said, look, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, he spoke to his disciples and he said this. Now, you know, Paul the Apostle and some of the disciples got past Judea, got past Samaria. But the influence here was to the end of the earth. And they influenced people who then influenced people. And it just kept going wider and wider and down through the generations. Till today, the gospel is being preached around the world. We are to be witnesses. God said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and that's when you get saved, when you are saved and the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit, you have power, and you are called to be God's witness. Now, I want you to notice what it says, and you might want to underline this in your Bible. Jesus is specific. He says, first of all in Jerusalem, then all of Judea, then Samaria, then to the end of the earth. And I want to explain that to you. If you look at this map that I have here, and if you can't see it very well, then go to a map of Palestine during the time of Jesus and find for yourself where Jerusalem is. Okay, on this map, it's right here. This is Jerusalem. So Jesus said, first of all, the Holy Spirit's going to meet you in Jerusalem. And I want you to be my witnesses right there in Jerusalem where you live. But then he says, I want you to go to all of Judea. Now, this is Judea. It's a province. I think of it sometimes as, you know, a county. We live in a certain town, but it's our city, but it's within a county. That's kind of what the provinces were. So he said, be witnesses, first of all, right where you're from, where you live. Then I want you to spread out into the province of Judea. Then he says, and to Samaria, which is the neighboring province. So that brings the circle out a little bit wider. And then he goes on to say, in the whole world, to the end of the earth. And so if I take a world map and I show you What's happening here, this little black dot represents, it's right over there in Israel. So we think of, that's Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then what Jesus is saying is widen the circle, keep moving, keep going, keep taking the gospel out, be missionaries, keep moving, keep going. And then he says, to the uttermost parts of the earth, and I just kind of visualize it this way, I made these concentric circles, right? to show you on a map of the world what Jesus was getting at. He was making a geographic statement, but he was also making a spiritual statement. Jesus meant start where you're at. You gotta start at home base. And whether they respond to you or not, because many do not, then you move out further. And whether they respond or not, then you move out further and you just keep going until the whole earth has heard the gospel. And that's in fact what happened. But if we take that from a spiritual perspective, we understand what the Bible tells us about our level of integrity. I mean, the, the very first thing you got to do is you got to be telling the people that you live with and that you're around the gospel. Amen. Parents, you got to be sharing the gospel with your children. Right. Spouses ought to be talking about the gospel. Now, sometimes they may reject and there may be a believer and an unbeliever and there may be believers of kids that don't believe but you start there you've got to have integrity you've got to be the witness use the power of the holy spirit within you and be who you're supposed to be then it goes outward then you got to do it where you work right you got to do it where you go to school you got to be witnesses in your Jerusalem. Then you got to be witnesses in your Judea. Then you got to be witnesses in your Samaria. Now you're out at the store somewhere or you're traveling on vacation. And do you lose your light when you go somewhere else or when you're with another group of people? Well, that was a convicting there. First. I just said something I didn't plan to say. Do you lose your light when you switch people groups? Is the Holy Spirit not supposed to shine in you no matter where you go in those circles? If you're losing your light with a particular group of people, you ought to be convicted right now. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
So, you know, the people that I, that I work with, that I talk with, my family members, they ought to know who I am for Jesus Christ. And when I'm at my favorite restaurant at Wendy's, I better act like and live like I love Jesus Christ in front of them, right? Wherever I go. So I, I believe that what God was saying here is like Sarah, we're not supposed to be just one particular person's influence. We're supposed to influence many people and have integrity and stay consistent and widen our influence as it goes on and on and on. John Phillips, Sarai means my princess, and evidently it was a name of endearment as well as a personal name, for lovely Sarai was firmly enthroned in Abraham's heart. Now God took that sweet name and gave it a whole new significance. Instead of my princess, she was going to be a princess. The personal name became the positional name. That is what the grace of God does for a person. It ennobles. I love that. Well, I want, now I want to go in John Phillips' statement. Right? He says, that name, the personal name became a positional name. That is what the grace of God does for a person. It ennobles. There are way too many of you, and I know this to be true. I've been in ministry long enough to see it, whether it's churches or Christian schools or youth groups or adults, it doesn't matter. There are way too many of you that haven't grabbed hold of this. Your family hasn't treated you like you're noble. The world, your employer hasn't treated you like you're noble. But when you come to Jesus Christ, you are lifted up and ennobled, my friend. Now, John Phillips is not kidding here. I want you to go to Revelation 1, 5 and 6. We're going we're gonna to look at this scripture at the very beginning of the book of Revelation. Speaking of Jesus Christ, the Bible says to Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Who's thankful you've been freed from your sins? The penalty and the price of your sins, the power of your sins. Amen. One day we'll be freed from the presence of them. But he loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Watch this. And has made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. All right. You might want to underline that in your Bible. Those of you with a low self-esteem might want to underline that in your Bible. Those of you who feel beaten down by life, but Jesus is your savior, you may want to underline that in your Bible. The devil's trying to come against you and tell you you're not, you're not, you're not. And God is coming to you right now and telling you, you are, you are, you are. Amen? This is nothing we did. This is what Jesus has done. He freed us from our sins by his blood and did this. And this is where the church has gone wrong and ministries have gone wrong in cheapening the gospel. They, you know, well, they don't even mention the blood hardly anymore, but they want to talk to people about raising your hand and getting saved, believing in Jesus. But how about the fact that after your sins are forgiven, you are also a kingdom. You are a priest. Look at that. What does that mean? What in the world does that mean? First of all, let's talk about being a kingdom. Jesus has made us a kingdom. Now, if we're a kingdom, that means each one of us is royalty. Amen? We are royalty. Here's what it means. <clears throat> Alexander McLaren. I love his writing. And here's what he said. He said, I think that the true kingship, which comes as the consequence of Christ's emancipation of us, from the guilt and power of sin is dominion over ourselves. That is the real royalty to which every man and woman, whatever his position may aspire and may exercise. Now, I don't want to go too fast over this, so I'm going to slow it down. I want you to read this one more time. The consequence of Christ freeing us from our guilt and the power and dominion of, of, of the power of sin, watch this, is we have dominion over ourselves. And that's what royalty is. 
We have the ability to rule ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I had been studying this some time ago. And I had, then I had a beautiful talk with my young 13-year-old friend, Taya. We had a beautiful talk. We were having a discussion about God one time, and I was able to share this with her in so many words. I said, look, here's what Jesus has done for you. He's made you a king over your own self. You're a king over your own. That, and it really resonated. Like we talked about what that meant and it really changed things for her. And I'm praying that it changes things for you. You have been made a kingdom. Jesus has freed you from the dominion, from the power of sin. You are royalty. You're now in charge, of course, through Christ over yourself. How many of you know that self-discipline is something that's not popular today? And yet the Bible tells us that we are to be people who have self-control and self-discipline. We get that power from the Holy Spirit. Now, Alexander McLaren went on to say this, Christ and Christ alone makes us fit to control all of our nature. And he does it by pouring into us his own spirit, which will subdue by strengthening all the motives which should lead men to obedience by setting before them the perfect pattern in himself and by the communication of his own life, which is symbolized by his blood cleansing us from the tyranny under which we have been held. See, the Bible says he's freed us from our sins by his blood. There is this implication there that I was a slave and Jesus cooperates that and the apostle Paul cooperates that and the apostle John cooperates that in Revelation, what we just read. There is a sense in which before you, and if you haven't trusted in Christ, I want you to know something. You're a slave to sin. Sin rules over you. You can't help yourself but be a sinner. But when you trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. And God, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's God. So if God lives in me, who is stronger? My flesh, which tends towards sin, or God Almighty? And the answer is God Almighty. When temptation comes to me through whatever the source is, who is stronger, the temptation or God? And the answer is God. So if God lives in me, look at this. I have power to come out from under that tyranny. So oftentimes Christians will say, but I just can't stop. You're saying the wrong thing. But Jesus Christ in you can stop. Amen? Amen. Or some Christians say, you know, concerning sins of commission, people say, but I just can't stop committing them. Jesus in you can. The Holy Spirit in you can. And then concerning sins of omission, many Christians find themselves saying, oh, but Shelly, you know, I, I just can't do that. I can't be on fire like that. I can't do. You're speaking wrong. The Holy Spirit in you can. Amen. So we become royalty. We become the masters of our own self because we serve the master who gives us the power to subdue the flesh. We were slaves. He makes us free and making us free. He enthrones us. He that is king over himself is the true king. You can't be king over anybody else. You can't be king over the world's circumstances. You can't be king over your personal circumstances. You can't be king over anybody else's decisions. But you can be king over your own self because of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen out there? It's time for the people of God to claim the ability to control the self that comes by the Holy Spirit. In John 8, 34 through 36, this is Jesus talking. He's talking to the Pharisees. 
The Pharisees are bragging to him and saying, oh, we're sons of Abraham by blood. We're sons of Abraham by blood. And Jesus was like, I don't care if you're sons of Abraham by blood. You are not sons of God. Because you are not trusting in me. You're trusting in your own works. You're not saved. But here's what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And, and the key here is the word practice. You know, you would say, well, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Yeah, we, we're all sinners. We're born into sin. But there's a difference between telling lies and being a liar. There's a difference between committing sexual sin and being an adulterer. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a difference between talking about somebody and being a gossip, practicing gossip on a regular basis. And the Bible's very clear on this. Christians fail. We fall into sin. But when we do, we hate it. It's the anomaly. It's the blip on the computer screen. It's not the big, long picture. We feel the conviction. We confess it quickly to the Lord and we move on. But the Bible says when you don't have Jesus, when you practice sin, you're absolutely a slave to sin. You can't stop. The slave does not remain in the house forever. It's the son who remains forever. The slave does not gain the inheritance and keep the house. It is the son, the daughter. So Jesus said, if the son with a capital S sets you free, what did he say? You will be what? Free indeed. If Jesus comes into your life, and you trust in him as your savior, he sets you free. You're not under the tyranny of yourself and your flesh, the flesh part of you anymore. Through Christ, you're able to overcome sin. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, Paul corroborates the same thing. Beautiful passage here. Paul said, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let anybody condemn you. And I know some people on here, you struggle with that. Don't let your friends condemn you that you used to sin with. People who know your old life, your old self. Don't let them condemn you. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. People may say it, but that doesn't matter. You stand before the Lord of the universe is free and clean, okay? Now watch this. For the law of the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of what? Sin and death, because the wages of sin is death. Without Christ, here's where you're at. You're on a road of sinfulness, and it's going to take you straight to death and then eternal hell. If you're on the road with Jesus, then operating in you is the Holy Spirit, and he is the Holy Spirit of life. And he sets you free from all that. And he gives you the power to overcome. For if, he goes on in verse 13 and 14 to say, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now let's just stop there. This is a pretty drastic statement. It reminds me of when Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Right? It's a pretty drastic statement. This is a pretty drastic statement. If by the Spirit, you think, oh, well, the Holy Spirit, he's just so nice. Right? He's just so, so nice. He's very powerful. I wouldn't call the Holy Spirit nice. It's like I wouldn't call Jesus a nice guy. I'd call him kind. But he is very powerful and very serious. And the Holy Spirit, who gives us the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, right, is also the same Spirit who does what? Underline it in your Bible. What does he cause you to be able to do? Say it with me. Put to death the deeds of the body. Put to death the deeds of the body. That's a drastic statement. The implication there is, is that our flesh part of us, the old nature of us, really wants to do wrong. 
And it's going to take some radical power to stop that. And you don't have the power on your own. My friend, if Jesus is not your savior, you don't have the power to stop sinning. But if you trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ comes to live in you and gives you the power to put to death the deeds of the flesh. You can stop sinning as you used to by his power. And if you do that, you will live. See, isn't this interesting? You got to put to death the deeds of your body in order to live. And, and something just hit me. Do you know how the world operates? This just hit me. The world does the exact opposite. The world says, let me give in to the deeds of my body and that's living. Man, let me go get drunk. Let me go get high. Let me go do whatever I want sexually. And that's living, man. That's life. Let me party. Let me live for self, man. Let me be greedy. Let me climb the corporate ladder. Let me make as much money as I can make. Man, I'm going to do everything that I can do. And that's living. World's got it completely backwards. You want to live? Yeah, that was a Holy Spirit moment. I didn't plan that one. That's extra. You don't have to pay extra for that. You don't have to give extra likes and thumbs up for that. That was all the Holy Spirit just now, but that just hit me and it's so true. If you really want to live, my friend, if you're watching this and you really want to live, ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Ask the Holy Spirit to live in you. Start putting to death your sinfulness. Start reading the word of God and putting to death your sinfulness, putting to death everything that this Bible says is wrong. Don't listen to the world. Listen to what the word of God says. Put to death everything that the Bible says is wrong by the power of Jesus in you. And guess what? Underline it. You will live. That's living. That is living. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons or God. And, and I think I did a TikTok on that once. And I want to reiterate this. A lot of people say, how do I know that I'm saved? Are you led by the spirit of God? How do you know you're a child of God? You know, not everybody is a child of God. I take hits for this all the time. People want to say, oh, everyone that's born is a child of God. No, that's not true. Everyone that's born is a creation of God. Everyone that's born is a creation of God and he loves them. But the only way you get a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. If you want to know if you're really a child of God, let me ask you a question. Are you being led by the Spirit of God? I feel the Holy Spirit telling me to pause here and reemphasize this. I'm going to ask this question again. Don't fool yourself. If you want to know if you're saved, I want you to ask yourself this question on a daily basis. On a regular basis, when you consider your life, I want to ask you this. Is it you, your own flesh, the voices of the world, the voices of other people that are leading you in the direction you should go in your conversation, in your actions, in your lifestyle? Or is the Holy Spirit of God leading you? Right? You'll hear me often say, oh, I, I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead this Bible study. I hear the Holy Spirit prompting me to do this, that. That's the way it should be in all of our lives. And that's how you know you're a son or a daughter of God. Good litmus test. Alexander McLaren went on to say, in the measure in which we hold ourselves in close union with that Savior, we are set free from all selfish dependence on and regard to the judgments of perishable and fallible creatures like ourselves. Hallelujah. And then the second part of this is we've been made priests, not just kings, but priests. What does that mean? We have direct, ac direct access to God. We enter the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. When Jesus died on the cross, that curtain split in two, and every believer has direct access to the throne of God. Isn't that amazing? Every once in a while when I'm praying, I just say, God, I stand amazed that I can even talk to you. This is the greatest miracle of all that I have direct access to you. And what else does the priest do? The priest represents God to the world. And we call people to be reconciled to him. 
We are priests. We have direct access to the throne of God. And we represent God to this world. I want you to remember that wherever you go, work, school, home, restaurant, vacation, grocery shopping, party, get together, lunch with friends. Listen, I want you to remember that wherever you go, you're representing God to the world. And as a priest, you should also be trying to reconcile people to God. That doesn't mean every time you see them, you're preaching at them. But you're working towards that goal and prayerfully knowing that everywhere you go, you want to leave that sweet savor of the Holy Spirit wherever you go, of Jesus Christ wherever you go. Sometimes God will say directly witness. Sometimes he'll say, just say this or that or act this way or show this love. But you're trying to reconcile the world to God in everything that you do. Then God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless her. And moreover, I'm going to give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Matthew Henry said the blessing of the Lord makes fruitful and adds no sorrow with it. No such sorrow as in Hagar's case, right? Hagar's situation was not a blessed situation and it brought sorrow. But in this case, no sorrow would come with it. I will bless her. I will bless her, God says. Henry Morris said she had been barren all her life and was now 90 years old. So it would take a very special blessing for her to have a son. Amen? And how many of you know circumstances do not dictate what God is going to do in your life? Hallelujah. Circumstances don't dictate. If God says I'm going to bless her, then I'm going to bless her. And I'll stand and testify to you guys again. Truly, I, I am defying mathematical odds with type 1 diabetes since age 13. I really shouldn't, by, by mathematical standards, really shouldn't be this healthy. But when God stood back and said, I'm calling her and I'm going to bless her, that doesn't mean I'm never going to get sick. I'm not claiming that. I'm just saying, when God says, I'm going to bless you, he'll do what he wants to do. It doesn't matter what circumstances say. So it doesn't matter. You may say, but I'm too poor. I'm too unhealthy. I don't have enough influence. I'm too this. I'm too that. Listen, if God's going to bless you, he's going to bless you. And circumstances don't dictate that. How many of you know that the blessing of God can move mountains in your life? How many of you know that God can do the impossible when he places his blessing upon you? Amen? So listen, you've turned to Jesus as your savior. You're pursuing him. You have his blessing. He is going to move in your life. And now here's the critical verse. And this is what we want to end this session with. Then Abraham fell on his face. I mean, he didn't just laugh here. He fell on his face and laughed. Anybody ever done that? Guys, I got to tell you something. Let me just back up and be goofy for a second. How many of you were on the live stream? I don't know how long ago that was, a, a year or so ago. <laughs> when the technical department accidentally had put a filter on the live stream. Didn't know it. It was a total accident. She didn't even know it. So I get up here and I walk onto the set. How many of you remember this? I walk on and as soon as my, the, the, the screen recognizes my face and I turn, all of a sudden the filter put a black top hat and black sunglasses on me. It was hysterical. I happened to be wearing a shirt that looked like black and white striped. I had a black top hat and sunglasses. I looked like, I don't know what, some kind of spy. I don't know what I looked like. She didn't even know it. She's busy talking to the people online as people are getting on the live stream. It's the very beginning of this. And I'm talking and I'm being all serious. I'm talking about God and I'm going on. I'm in a total disguise and I don't even know it. And she does it. And then finally she looks at the screen. She says, she looked up the screen, did a double take, looked back down at her screen. She looked at me and she said, she doesn't have a hat and glasses on. What? And she panicked, right? And she finally figured out how to get the filter off, but it went on for a couple minutes. I didn't know. Apparently she stifled her laugh like every three or four minutes. She said she almost just bust out laughing. She had to hold it in the whole session, the whole hour. She held it in, right? And when it was over, she comes to me and cowers down to me and says, Shelly, I have something to tell you. I'm like, and I knew it wasn't good. I'm like, what? You know? So she takes the phone and she shows me. 
I want to tell you, this is a situation where, okay, I fell on my face. Like I fell on the ground laughing. We could not stop laughing. We're cleaning up the studio. I'm going up, I'm getting a drink. You know, we're, this is an hour, an hour and a half later and still trying to watch a television program and still every few minutes just randomly bust into laughter, right? <clears throat> this is a serious, this is a serious situation, but this is real laughter here. Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. A hearty laugh. And he said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? Now, I want to point something out to you before we go any further with this. Abraham is asking in joyful wonderment about an old woman having a child by the promise of God. I'm 100, she's 90. I mean, come on, really? He's pretty much saying she's an old woman, right? But you know what that sent my mind to? We think that's a miracle for an old woman who's barren to have a child. What about Isaiah 7, 14? The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. You talk about a miracle, not just a barren woman who's old, but a virgin. Can you imagine? My mind moves forward 2000 years from Abraham to Joseph the stepfather of Jesus. An angel told him to not fear taking the pregnant virgin as his wife because Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph believed and obeyed. I love that because I believe Abraham and Sarah are kind of a foreshadowing of the virgin birth. Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. And as we're going to see, Abraham's laugh here is not a scoffing laugh. It's like a laugh of joyful relief. Are you kidding me? You're going to do this for me? And it's a foreshadowing of, my goodness, when Joseph would be told, oh yeah, your wife's a virgin, but she's pregnant. But trust me, <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit who put the baby in there. Joseph believed. Amen? Because Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your arch, outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Hallelujah. Now, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Henry Morris. Abraham was so elated at God's promise that he laughed with joy and surprise. That it was not a laugh of doubt is evident from the fact that God gave him no rebuke as he later did when Sarah laughed. And we'll get to that eventually. Sarah laughed at God and it was a, God rebuked her for it. Here he gets no rebuke. The questions which Abraham asked likewise were not in doubt, but in wonder and happy amazement. J. Vernon McGee, old Abraham just laughed. This is not the laughter of unbelief. I think it's the laughter of just sheer joy that this could happen. I'm sure that you've had this experience. Every now and then in our lives, God does something for us that is so wonderful that we just feel like laughing. You don't know anything else to do but to laugh about it. I just want to share with you, you say, well, what, what kind of example would you give, Shelly? Well, I'm going to share with you um, a, about a, almost a year ago, you know, as I was talking about my disease, you know, 39 years, well, it was 38 years last year, 38 years with type one diabetes, it largely can affect the blood vessels, the tiny capillaries in your eyes and your kidneys. And there's two things diabetics have to have checked very often. And after 38 years, I know I'm pushing the odds and, and I get very prayerful and very, I have to say anxious before my appointments to get my eyes checked because, you know, there are eyes. And I remember, I just get so burdened by it. And last year, and with the pandemic and everything that happened, when I went to that appointment last year, I went in and 38 years diabetic and the ophthalmologist looked at me and said, crystal clear. Your eyes are perfect. There's not a sign of a hemorrhage. Your retina is healthy. Your macula is healthy. You know, and I'm sitting in the chair and I'm like thankful and grateful when I'm talking to him, but 
I got outside of the office, you know, I, I, I signed out, went past the receptionist back through the waiting room and got out the front doors of the office. And, and it, was, it was a laugh and a cry. It was kind of both, you know, I remember holding the paper or whatever I'd been given and I just kind of almost stumbled, you know, and I just started to cry and I just, <laughs> I laughed. I'm like, I can't. And I remember putting my hands up in the air and I remember saying, oh, I can't believe this. Have you ever done that? I can't believe this. And there's a smile on your face and you're laughing. It's just sheer relief. It's like, are you kidding me, God? I'll give you another example. I mean, maybe you guys think I'm joking when I tell you this, but it's the absolute truth. So I don't know, you know, um, any of my neighbors have cameras on their houses, they could verify if this happens. But I go out to the I go out to my mailbox to get the mail. And the other day I opened, you know, the mailbox and I, and there's some letters, some donations, some cards, some letters to Hope and Passion. And if it's nice weather out, I sit outside on the porch and do it. If not, I go in the house. But I remember opening this card just the other day. I had a donation in it, but the bigger thing was when I opened it up and I read this person, I read what they said. When I open up a card in my house and I hear from somebody in another part of the country that I've never met and they write, Dear Shelley, and they proceed to tell me that they got saved, like they trusted in Jesus and they can't wait to meet me in heaven. Or I read a card and it says, I, I knew God for decades and decades, but I never understood. I never really lived for him. And now I'm witnessing the people. And I got to tell you, I sat in my house the other day on the couch and I, I just literally laughed. I opened up the card and I just <laughs> like that. I was, God, you got to be kidding me. You did this. This is a miracle. It's just me. It's just me and you've opened up this ministry and you're touching lives and, and I just laughed. Somewhere between a laugh and a cry. And sometimes, yeah, you just have to sit down, you have to fall down. You have to say, God, for real? Listen, John Phillips said, Abraham laughed out of sheer joy. The glorious impossibility of it. Why, when God had first spoken to him about a, a, a son 25 years earlier, then it was bordering on the impossible. But now, now he was an old man. And Sarah was an old, old woman. He laughed the laughter of faith as Romans 4 makes perfect, perfectly clear. Here's another cooperation that it was a laughter of faith. The Bible says Abram did not weaken in faith when he, was, when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do exactly what he had promised. God hasn't called us all to the same things and he's not going to do the same impossible things for me as he does for you or vice versa. He's up to something in everybody's life, but I still have to remember when I was 13 years old and I knelt beside my bed after being a, becoming a diabetic and I remember God calling me to ministry. And I remember as a young child, as a teenager, standing out in my backyard with a homemade pulpit that my dad had made for me. I remember preaching outside to the squirrels and the trees. I remember preaching to groups of 10 and 15 people and just staying faithful to God and believing his promise and his calling that he could do the impossible. And now I go out to my mailbox on a pretty regular basis and I either cry or laugh as I stand amazed at the impossible that God has done. God has something for every one of us, something that he's called us to, something that he's promised us, 
You feel the prompting in your heart and I'm asking you to trust Jesus for it. I'm asking you like Abraham to believe even when all circumstances seem to be against it. My friend, I know you want to live for Jesus in every circumstance and you know, your old lifestyle and all those things are coming against you and you don't have many people to stand strong with Christ with you and listen, hold fast to the promise. God can do the impossible. You want family members to be saved. God can do the impossible. You want to be on fire for Jesus. You want to get over fear and anxiety. You want to be able to trust him. God can do the impossible. He can do it. And he will do it. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray right now for people to be saved. And I'm going to pray for those of us who know Jesus. To be able to laugh the laughter of faith. To be able to appreciate what God has done and realize the miracles that he's performing. And to hold strong and steady. Amen. And I'm praying for a group of people too that you will learn that you are royalty in Jesus. You are a kingdom. You are a priest for God. Live by it. Walk in the light. Lord God, thank you for the amazing things you've done tonight. I know you've sent out a lot of different messages to a lot of different people here. You've emphasized different things, dear Holy Spirit, to different people. But right now, I'm going to ask that all of you who know Jesus as Savior, would you pray right now uh, and ask the Lord to do a mighty work in some hearts. Pray for those who don't yet know Jesus. Pray for them now. And God, I ask for any who are watching this live stream or by recording, who are on the precipice of trusting in Jesus as Savior, that they would do it in this moment. Help them to just reach, reach out and say, I may not know everything, but I know enough to know this. I need Jesus. I need him to forgive my sin. I need him to save my soul. I need him to set me free. If that's you, just say it to him wherever you are. He, his Holy Spirit will come to you in that moment right now and fill your life. Thank you, Lord. Christian, if you've called to be the light, you're not walking in the light, listen to God right now and confess to him that you want to begin doing so. Dear Christian, if you are not acting as the royalty that you are, as the priest that you are, as the, the master over your flesh through Jesus that you should be, confess that to him right now. He's going to do a miracle in you. And my friend, let's all pray. That in the very near future, we will be able to laugh the laughter of faith as we watch God answer prayers that we thought could have never been answered. Lord, give us faith. Give us trust in you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does my heart good to teach this Tuesday night Bible study. That was a wonderful time. And I know the Lord moved in many of you tonight. So thank you for going through the whole study with us. I want to invite you again. If Hope and Passion Ministries is giving you Jesus. And if you want us to continue to be able to do that. If you want to invest in the souls of other people to find Jesus. Please pray about giving. And by all means, next Tuesday night, 630, if as the Lord wills, we'll be live streaming again. And Sunday morning for our Revelation live stream series. Know this, I am praying for you. We do love you. And Jesus has got you. Well, hello there, everyone. And Pat, you are right. This is a fun group. I love watching everybody sign on and greet each other and uh, talk about lifting up prayer needs for one another. So, Joanna, I thank you that you are tuning in from New York with, I know we have at least someone else from New York, and that's exciting that you can be a part of this. And Kathy, hello to you. I saw that you said hello to me, and, and I sure miss seeing you. 
I miss seeing a lot of you. Hi to Sue and Larry. Just giving some shout outs to some of you whose names just really impressed upon my heart as you were tuning in tonight. So you've joined the Genesis Bible Study. My name is Shelly Prindle. I know that some of you that have logged on, I don't know you. Maybe you know me, but I'm Shelly Prindle. This is Hope and Passion Ministries. And we are dedicated to teaching and preaching God's holy word. So how many of you out there are waiting upon the Lord, right? How many of you are struggling, but you are waiting upon the Lord? Do you know that when the Bible says those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their